नमो नमो रमणा अ वेरी वॉम वेलकम टू ऑल द डिविटीज ऑफ डेली रमन केन्द्र संडे सत्संग आई शेल नॉट रिक्वेस्ट नारायण जी एट द श्राइन ऑफ रमन केन्द्र डेली टू इनिशिएट द पूजा नारायण जी
A very warm welcome to all the devotees of Delhi Kendra's uh, Sunday Satsang. We shall continue our, uh, our uh, Satsang for 42 select verses from Bhagavad Gita. Today, we will be studying verse 33 and 34. They tell us about the individual's journey over several lifetimes to arrive at mature self-knowledge. Such a sage is called Sthit Pragna. Sthit Pragna, as he effortlessly abides as the self and has overcome the bondage of strong desire. Our speaker for, these, for this session will be Sri Raghav Kumarji, a long-time devotee of Bhagwan and a resident near the ashram in Thiruvannamalai. Uh, Sir, I would request you to take over. Namo Ramana. <laughs> Om Satana Babatu, Satana Punaktu, Sahade Yankarava, Ages Vina, but he Thomas Toma, Vishava, Om Shanti 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 Ishvaro Guru, made the most dipped every pagani, Yoma Vatya, the day one day she Ramana Shade, Pachar, Yasyapada, Jam, Yobi, the Shigati, Jam, Pantam, Pantamati, Parthasar, Pena, Shavaki, Pashupam, Jiram, Parthasyati, Devaha, Pam, Tisapatuna. Welcome to this. Continuation of our study of Bhagavan's 42 verses from the Bhagavad Gita. So, before we begin our session today, I just wanted to share with all the devotees that a really nice initiative has been undertaken by the Delhi Kendra beginning this May about Narayana Seva. 
and their devotees are every Sunday, I'm told, given viksha, given prasad. This is a really noble initiative by the Delhi Kendra. I'm reminded of how this whole concept was, of course, there in our tradition and recently revived in modern times by Swami Vivekananda, where he would say that for the modern man, worship of Ishvara in man is much nobler and much, much more effective than other methods. So that was his take. So looking upon the divinity in each human being, one does whatever service is possible for that human being. So this idea of seeing Narayana in a human being was very dear to Swami Vivekananda. And he used to coin that word Narayana Seva. So that's really not something which we are placing ourselves on a pedestal. In fact, it is an opportunity to do this seva to fellow human beings who are in some distress or some need. So I'm really happy that Narayana Seva is being conducted by the Ramana Kendra Delhi on Sundays and told. And I wish that all devotees are able to partake and participate in this noble activity. Many thanks, sir. Uh, just a quick correction, uh, Raghavji. This is conducted right now, first Sunday of every month. Oh, yes. Okay. It's on the first Sunday of every month. Yeah, thank you, Maharaji, for that information. So I'm sure uh, that it will be a very uh, joyous endeavor to participate, as I see in Ramanashramam Thiruvannamali as well, that there is a certain joy in offering food to devotees. And this is a continuation of that tradition here. So I'm happy about that. So to now continue our discussion of Bhagavad Gita, we are now studying verse 33 and 34, which is towards the last half of this beautiful text, the song Celestial, Gita Sadaha. As you know, Bhagavan's selected verses have the title Gita Sadaha, the essence of the Gita. And the way Bhagavan has strung these verses, if you remember, is to first give the whole tattva, the very essential truth about the self. And for those of us who are sufficiently having that shraddha and those who are sufficiently prepared, that very unfoldment of the tattva is sufficient to help the mind resolve as the self. So, which is why for the uttama dhikaris, those who are ripened in their sadhana, having practiced other methods such as japa, such as other upasanas, and those who don't have a very strong emotional obstacle of any kind present in them, for them the very unfoldment of the tattvam, of the truth of what I is by the Guru, is sufficient to immediately center the mind as that very self. We see that in the cases of some of Bhagavan's closest devotees, such as Sri Masthan and even Akhilandamma later on. So these uh, devotees of Bhagavan were so totally full of that spirit of renunciation, that shatha, that just a few words from the master were enough to help the mind quieten down and be with its source, which is the self. So Sri Krishna also follows that method in the Bhagavad Gita. Initially, he takes Arjuna as if it were a very high plane. He doesn't try to support Arjuna's sorrow or you know, validate so much his emotion. Instead, he says, come on, snap out of it. You are made of sternal stuff. You are that self which is immortal. And he doesn't compromise at all. Krishna there. And later on, Bhagavan then refers to karma yoga, the need to offer one's actions in a spirit of service to Ishvara, and then accept whatever comes our way 
with equipoise. So that's not an easy practice at all, although it's very popular to say, oh, he's doing karma yoga. That's a very difficult and challenging task, no less. So Krishna then says, if a person cannot directly understand that I am that pure self untouched by anything that happens in space or time, then he is given to karma yoga. He is given the instruction of karma yoga. So here too, Bhagavan in Gita Sarada first enforced the tattvam, essence of what you are. And then he goes on to teach some of the methods and practices and the journey of the spiritual aspirant as he practices meditation, as he tries to stay true to the teaching of the master. What are the challenges that come? All of that has come later in this verse, in this uh, text. And so today the discussion is about the end part of that spiritual journey that each jiva undergoes, this fantastic journey through so many lifetimes. And the verse is in the seventh chapter of the Gita. We will read it and then we will study it. Bahu namam dhumma namam te jnana vanma pravadyate vasudeva sarvamiti samahatma sudhullavaha Bahu nam janma nam ante jnana vanmam prabadyate vasudeva sarvamiti samahatma sudhullavaha It's a very nice verse which encapsulates this whole journey through so many lifetimes of preparation for jnana. Bahu naam, Bahu naam means several, numerous, janmana mante. At the end of those many lifetimes of preparation towards self-knowledge. Jnana van maam prapatyate. That person who has that insight into the Atman, the self, maam prapatyate. He attains to Krishna. Krishna here is the innermost self who is all pervading. So he becomes non-different from Ishwara. Vasudeva Sarvamiti. And then such a jnani sees Ishwara as the truth of all that exists. He has no more a sense of alienation with respect to this Vishti. In contrast, each of us has this slight alienation. Why is this world the way it is? It could have been better. All that is because there is a deeper source of some distress. Why did it happen to me? I could have got a better deal. So there is some alienation, which is quite understandable. It's not wrong to feel like that. And it's just that as one assimilates Ishwara Tattvam, as one assimilates that all this is as per that intelligent principle Ishwara, there is no alienation. The ending of the alienation happens. So a person has no more agenda for this world. He doesn't want to see it as any different from what it is. He sees some intelligence working there with which he is one. He is harmonious, that intelligence. So he is no more any resentment, any kind of resistance to what is, is not there for that person. So such a person is what is described here as that Jnanavan who says, Vasudevaha Sattvamiti. All that exists here is the Lord Vasudeva himself. Quite clearly a very extraordinary vision and the behavior and lifestyle follow from that vision. Vasudeva Sarvamiti Samahatma So extraordinary, it's very rare. Samahatma, such a great soul is Sudurlabaha. It's very rare indeed. Dudlavaha itself is rare. So Dudlavaha is rarer than rare, extremely rare. Also goes to show that the one who is totally assimilated with Brahma Jnana is one in a million times. The idea is even one such great Mahatma keeps the tradition going for so many generations. Bhagavan came and that inspiration continues for so many generations. Sri Ramakrishna came, that inspiration has helped so many people at that time. 
So this tradition of just a few Mahatmas totally assimilated with the vision, being the sustainers of this entire dharma is something very profound and it is there in this country. So it's not a dharma which is based on preaching and you know, trying to convert others to our point of view. The person lives the life, deeply assimilates his vision that Aham Atma, I am that non-dual self. And that itself gives rise to this ecosystem of people inspired by that vision. That very life sustains the dharma. So that is the vision expounded here. Samahatma Sudhutlabhaha. This whole journey through many lifetimes is for sure with a certain directionality. It's not altogether random, is what is indicated here. Sri Shankara says here that there is a samskara which is happening. Jnana, jnanartha samskara ashtaya. In other words, as the person lives his lives one after the other, that samskara of jnana starts coming into that person's life. There is less and less resistance to Advaita. Otherwise, it's just too good to be true. A person resists Advaita. No, this cannot be. This is too, too much that I'm already what I want to be. I'm already free. Remember, Advaita doesn't say you will become free. It says you are already free. It's up to you to own it up. Yes, you have to no doubt look carefully to own it up. Practice that inquiry to understand that I want to be free. But it's not a new freedom that I acquire, I have to obtain from outside of myself. There are many human problems for which the solution is outside of the problem. For example, hunger. Hunger or thirst, the need for water at the global level, let's say. So the solution to that is from the outside. One needs to produce more food or organize its distribution to reach everyone. So many human problems have their solutions outside of those problems, and they have to be dealt with, with intelligence, with enterprise. But then there is another core human problem for which the solution is not outside of oneself. It is that core conviction that each human being has, I am inadequate. I am small. I am subject to sorrow. Aham dukhi, aham sukhi. All these deep-rooted notions which create distress in us, they are not going to go away by change of situations. I'm going to continue to feel small or inadequate, no matter what I do. So that is a journey through these Janmas. Through many Janmas, we have tried various alternatives to address this self-inadequacy, that I am not adequate. I have to be different from what I am. My environment is just something I do not want it to be like that, and I'm going to be miserable as long as the environment around me doesn't change. See the difference. It's not that we don't work to change the situation around us. However, we don't assume that I cannot be happy until something happens. So we don't deny the truth of that self until something is achieved or attained because it's a never-ending game. And that realization takes many janmas, many lifetimes. And so those who have come to discern that I do not wish really for a big change in my situation in life, fine, it's welcome, I might be for that, for changing things in my life, but I do discern that I need to work on myself, how I respond to those situations how I take myself to be drowned and affected by that situation. So I'm now looking not so much for a solution from outside of myself, but for a solution which is centered on me itself. 
not even my mind. That solution is centered on I, that I am subject to sorrow. Even if many people do not articulate it so clearly, it's a fact that if a person really says, my mind is subject to sorrow, he wouldn't worry about the mind. He wouldn't really worry about the mind. If he is really convinced, oh, my mind has sorrow, my mind is feeling some distress. It's not so much the mind. It is taken to be centered on the I. I am subject to sorrow. I am in distress. And as long as that problem is centered on the I, the self, the solution too is centered at that very locus. Which is why jnana or knowledge is the only way to resolve this deep-rooted notion of self inadequacy, self non acceptance. I don't accept myself as I am. And so, only through jnana, only through self knowledge, this can be resolved. Of course, we do what we have to do about our external situation, but then we also try to look into the fact that. I am deeply affected because of something centered on me. That wrong notion centered on me is also at rest. So we do work in parallel, if we like. So whatever can be changed externally, fine, we do change that. But we discern that the deeper solution really lies in self-understanding. So, Babu Nam, Janma Nam, Ante, Yanavan, Mam, all these other Janmas help us discern and arrive at this path or at this approach of self inquiry. If we are able to even practice self inquiry with some depth, we are able to see that I am free from the roles I play. Thoughts come and go, and the mind gently is allowed to resolve. A person has that commitment to Bhagavan's self inquiry method that itself is the culmination of several janmas. It's a great blessing to have that jnana samskara. Otherwise, there will be a lot of resistance to knowledge as the solution or as the way. People want to do something, maybe some worship, some. Mantra, all that is welcome, but the root solution, the core solution is self acquired. And so, over several janmas, as a person develops this jnana samskara, finally it culminates in this understanding that but the mind itself is part of the problem. It's not as if I look for a problem with my mind, but I'm able to see that the mind arises as a result of this avidya self-ignorance, this whole embodiment of being a limited jiva <clears throat> arises from that avidya, due to that avidya. And as a person is able to assimilate this vision that aham, Brahma, that non-dual self I am, and own Zikar through this Nididhyasanam, which Bhagavan says is the Aham Furana based meditation. That I am is non-dual, that I am is available in the sense that as a person withdraws from all thought identification, shifts his attention to that very thinker and the mind resolves. There is no more a mind which is even doing the self-inquiry. So that mind resolves and it solves. There is just Shuddha Chaitanyam. The Kaham Surana is what is the critical intermediate step to Brahma Jnana. So as the Kaham Surana arises, a person doesn't have to do anything more. That just is what is intended as the culmination of our Amsurana is the culmination of Atmavichara, and yet the force of the past samskaras will continue for a while to disturb or to draw the person out and identify with various things 
So that's where the second level sadhana of self inquiry continues until all the opposing pavanas, the viparita pavanas, are totally dead. So, due to our past habit, even though I am very clear and the mind is resolving as a pure Chaitanya, still there is some work, in a sense, to be done in addressing this viparita pavanas. The contrary notions which make us disposed to think of ourselves as small, I have this thing to do, I have to achieve something. So I still continue to believe in the story about myself. I think that I have this bio data and the current situation I am in is a continuation of my bio data. So that myth takes time to resolve, even as this arms corona based self-inquiry continues, that biodata gets weaker and weaker. It's taken less and less serious. One uh, devotee once asked Bhagavan that I have to attend to my job, but I actually want to remain in meditation all the time. And I feel there's a conflict. Is not there any conflict? And Bhagavan says that oh, there is no conflict. Continue to be committed to self-inquiry and you will find that whatever business you are doing, it will continue like a dream. So he gives a dream analogy. The person's unfulfilled, let's say, even if you want to use the word duty or whatever the remaining activities in a person's life will continue on autopilot like a dream. Even while his key commitment remains to being as the self. So the big difference here is that even if life throws so many challenges at that person, he just smiles, goes to them and is untouched. He comes out unscathed by those experiences. In contrast, without the practice of ahamsparana or any kind of deeper practice, whatever experiences we undergo leave a deep impress on the mind. They have left some residues. Again, they have to deal with so that becomes a kind of process which is self-perpetuating that I undergo experience in my life, they leave some impression in the, in the form of some distress or some positive feeling. And then that creates further inclination towards getting more and more involved in this circle of avidya, karma and karma. If you remember, you have seen that, that it is the cycle in contrast, a person who is committed to dhyanam, committed to self-inquiry, vidhyasana, the experiences of the person's life no doubt might appear to create some emotions, some sukha dukha will come, but they don't leave any big impress on the mind. They just come and go like a dream, as Bhagavan says to that devotee. So that is the big relief, big uh, improvement, if you like, in the person's way of processing his experiences. And then the last and final culmination is what is referred to in this shloka. Samahatma Sudurlapa Vasudeva Satramiti. No more there are these viparita bhavanas, no more contrary notions to disturb that person. And the reason why these contrary notions are of a limited kind, in other words, if you're practicing self-inquiry. Uh, the good news is that you only have to deal with a limited number of, if you like, obstacles in the mind. You know, for once, the mind's finiteness is your advantage. Because my mind is finite, it can only create a finite amount of uh, problems for me. Because my mind and memories are finite, only so much can really come up and disturb me. It's not as if the millions of samskaras accumulated over millions of lifetimes are going to obstruct me, not at all. There are only so many which are undergoing fructification in this janma. So I have to deal with only those which have started already fructifying those samskaras or vasanas or strong desires, which have already started you know, fructifying in this lifetime. They alone are my challenge. I don't really have to bother about all that is in the seed form. They get destroyed by the very practice of self-inquiry, ahamsvarana. Only these other, the current uh, account in our karma is what needs to be dealt with.
And so this method thus culminates in that jnana because it's a deterministic method. It's not a never ending process. You okay, more and more, more I have to go on fighting with my mind, not at all. There are a few limited challenges that come along with this package called the mind and body in this janma. And if I am able to deal with them, I am with the truth. It's going to have a finite conclusion that is the real good news of the path of self inquiry. Now we'll see the next shloka, which then telescopes into how or what are the obstacles to this last stage of the self inquiry process. This is a shloka from the second chapter, a very meaningful and a complete chapter in itself. For those of you who study the Bhagavad Gita, you may know that the second chapter of the Gita is regarded as a summary of the entire Gita. Almost every other idea is given in some way or the other. It's a very uh, beautiful summary, starting with the unfoldment of truth and karma yoga. And finally, the Sthita Pragna Lakshana is described in the second chapter. That is the characteristic of one who is firm in his wisdom. One whose wisdom is well established. Tita Pragna. That's a very beautiful word used by Arjuna first and Sri Krishna. That that person whose wisdom is steady and firm is called as Tita Pragna. Sita means firm and steady. Pragna means knowledge or wisdom. So there's an unwavering wisdom in that person. He's called as Tita Pragna. And this shloka Bhagavan has selected is a very uh, beautiful definition or a beautiful description of how the Sita Pragnaha experiences and has these various mental vrittis, how the mind of, Sita, of that Sita Pragnaha functions is described in this shloka. We will chant that. Prajahati yada kama sarvan parthe manukata atman yevatmana ushtaha stita pragnasta dochyate Prajahati yada kama sarvan parthe manukata atman yevatmana ushtaha stita pragnasta dochyate So this shloka is the 55th shloka in the second chapter. The literal meaning of this shloka is that that sita pragna, prajahati yada kama. He is one who has been able to tame all these strong desires in his mind. Prajahati is one who has destroyed yada kama all the binding desires in his life. The karma here refers not just to any simple desire, just to walk around, you know, stalk or something like that, but it refers to very deep rooted binding desires, which create so much dukkha. So Prajahati, he has destroyed, when all these desires which are binding him are destroyed, yada karma, sarvan parthi manogatam. So he's addressing partha, Manogatan, which are lodged in the buddhi. So there are certain desires which are more superficial and they are not meant here. They are, what is meant here are Manogatan. Here the mana is implied to be buddhi. Buddhi is the deeper part of the mind which says, I need this, I want this. Without that, I cannot be happy. Without that, I am not adequate. So those deep rooted uh, notions and desires are meant here. Manogatan Kama Prajahati. He is able to destroy all these Manogatamas. Lords deep in the Buddha. Not just that. Atmani Vatmana Pushtaha. He is not just going to wander around like a zombie. Okay, there are no desires. He just goes around in a kind of daze. Not so. Instead, Atmani Vatmana Pushtaha. There is a positive quality to that person of this. Atmani in the very self. Atmana tushtaha, the mind dissolves and therefore there is total contentment, total equanimity and peace there, born of the resolution of the mind. So that mind no longer has the usual characteristic of a mind which goes on drawing us out of ourselves and 
pulling us against our will towards whatever it, uh, some scars are there. So that mind no longer has the power. Instead, atmana, atmani, atmana, atmana. He revels in the self by himself. The mind there. One of the atma there refers to the mind. So that mind resolves in its source, the self. So there is total tushtihi. Tushtihi is satisfaction, leaving nothing else to be desired. There is no more pressure to seek something. So the total absence of agenda for himself or for others is a very defining characteristic of this. I don't have any agenda either for myself to achieve something or for another person around me. I am tushtaha, totally satisfied just being the self. That person is known as the self. So many of these characteristics, Sri Shankara Bhagavad Pada says in his commentary, are no doubt appearing as some very high level lakshanas or characteristics of the jnana. And yet they are the sadhanas for us who are sadhanas, who are on the journey to the spirit. So what are very natural for the jnana beings, lakshanas, are for us sadhanas. In other words, we carefully look into that. Why am I not able to be there? What are the obstacles that prevent my mind from being that way? So instead of trying to artificially you know, manipulate the mind, what is intended is that I look at the obstacles, examine closely the mind, what is it in the mind that makes it seek so much of external activity or objects or engagements. So I try to see that the natural condition of the mind is to be tushtaha. In any given human being, we have a physical body, right? So the physical body consists of what are known as the gross elements, the panchabhutas, but in a gross condition, which, which are more of tamas, inertia. They make up the physical body. And then the mind is made up of the sattvic amsha of those panchabhutas. The inherent quality of the mind is sattva guna. Sattva means of the nature of joy, of the nature of luminosity, of sukha and jnana. This is the basic condition of the mind if, if it is left to itself. But then it's not left to itself because there are all these samskaras, all these uh, older habit patterns which make the mind go into rajas and a bit of tamas. So those get added on, so to speak. And so due to the influence of some external factor, the mind becomes less of a sattva predominant entity. Otherwise, the mind by itself is sattva. In fact, one of the synonyms of what we call mind is sattvaha in the Sanskrit. Sattvaha means mind in all the uh, famous yoga sutras of Patanjali. The word sattvaha in, all, in uh, many of the sutras is used for the word mind. Mind is sattvaha. And those of you who know the three gunas, sattva rajas tamas will recognize that sattvaha is something desirable for sure, of the nature of lightness, of the nature of joy, of the nature of luminosity, knowledge. So these are all the characteristics of sattvaha, which is the mind. They are not really uh, coming from outside. What is coming from outside is rajas, one of desire. Desire and rajas go together. Or tamas, inertia, laziness, sleep. Those characteristics are extraneous to the mind. The mind just left to settle down becomes sattva. That's the uh, teaching here of the Lord. And so, prajahati yada gaman, sarvan even as that person is able to see through these desires, atmane vatmanantushtaha, the mind naturally comes down, becomes full of joy. What every human being sees is that very joy. And yet, the objects, why do they give that joy temporarily? Because temporarily, the mind is in such a disturbed state that the tamas resolves. See, this is very interesting. It is said that the reason why an object gives joy is because 
there is some tamas already in the mind. When that object is attained or achieved temporarily, it does two things. The tamas goes away because there is a certain joy of, of attainment. The desire is also fulfilled and a new desire has not arisen. So tamas is gone because of the stimulation of the external object and rajas, which is of the nature of desire, is also not there. So temporarily, whenever you satisfy a desire, both rajas and tamas are very minimal. So sattva, which is the natural condition of the mind, is manifesting there. It's coming up, which is why the ananda is there. So jo the joy is not coming from the object. The object is merely getting rid of the tamas and also able to temporarily give you freedom from rajas because you desired that object. You had superimposed so much value on that object. So that rajas was there before. Now the object you have attained, that success, or that uh, happiness from outside. So temporarily that rajas also is gone. You don't have any more desire. So the total absence of desire combined with absence of tamas gives you sattva, which is the natural state of the mind. For this jnani or even the jnana sartaka, who has access to ahamsvarana, who uses ahamsvarana as his sadhana, for him as well, he is able to tap that natural sattva of the mind. And the mind, as Bhagavan would say, cuts all the other thoughts and their contents and just comes back. Whenever a thought comes, just shift the attention back to the thing thought. That's but one big thought. By doing this over and over, the energy and power behind those objects and those thoughts gets reduced. And so therefore, Prajaha is able to weaken first and then completely destroy that desire. So remember, it's not just a method, it's also born of a cognitive understanding that I am of the nature of fullness. Bhagavan has already taught that I am of the nature of fullness. I am not this small being. All of this is in the background. And that conviction in that very teaching brings about this cessation of the mind's restlessness. Atmanevatmanavishta. The more a person practices, the more he gets the conviction this is true. Because you are able to encounter a certain happiness which is not born of any object from outside. You are able to say, yes, of course, the mind's natural quality is sattva, of the nature of joy. I don't need to seek it from outside. These words ring true for that person. And born of that, the person progresses more and more. He shows more and more commitment to this path where you are able to discover yourself as Purna. What you want is already what you are. You are able to see the truth of that statement. You are already what you want to be. It's just that the mind with its outgoing tendencies as it were presents an obstacle. And once the mind's deeper and strong desires are dealt with, it no longer obstructs this Atmananda. So, Shankara uses the word Paramarthya Darshana Rasa. So, he says there is a certain joy born of Paramarthya Darshana. And this joy is not just an ordinary joy coming from any object. It is the very Swarupa of the mind to manifest that joy. And so, born of this practice, that's Siddha Pragna, therefore, has nothing else to seek outside of itself. As I once quoted, Bhagavan was once asked, why doesn't he go around to different places and preach and eat? In Bhagavan says, I see the same self everywhere. There wouldn't be any change, no variety for me. I wouldn't have any experience of any big variety. Okay, there are different colors and forms, but that's not the idea, right? So Bhagavan says, I see the same self everywhere. There is a question of any newness, any kind of difference if I change my place or time. So that person is Atmaneva And what is a lakshana, a spontaneous attribute of the like of a jnani, 
is to be carefully nurtured by the sadhana. Those of us who are on the path and are committed to self inquiry, we carefully nurture this. What do we nurture? We nurture this very practice of discovering ananda, discovering joy without any external object. And the more we discover joy without depending on an external object, the more we are drawn to this path of life. So it's a virtuous uh, cycle. Instead of a vicious circle, we have a virtuous circle. So adhikasya adhikam falam. We are more and more drawn into this self inquiry So that is the beauty of the path where it's not all cerebral, it's not all dry. There is a certain definite avidhava manifestation of ananda. You can call it ananda avidhava. Paramartha darshana rasa is there. Shankara says. There is a joy in this very vritti. That is the natural condition or natural sarupa of what you are. Not one of any external objects. So that is the import of this shloka. The interesting thing in this whole context is how you can see that the many janmas are for the sake of seeing through these desires. So these numerous desires which keep coming up again and again need to be resolved in the wake of knowledge. So that knowledge of Atma helps you to see through the bluff of each of these desires. So it's a journey of evolution, all right, but the evolution is towards understanding that I am full and complete. It's not a new change or acquiring something that I don't already have. There is a famous shloka in the Kathopanisha, uh, sort of giving a clear guideline into what actually determines the next life, a question which is very popular or uh, of interest to many of us. Usually, Bhagavan would discourage too much questioning about past lives and so on, because he felt that's a game of the mind, you know, that goes on trying to think of some things about karma, about past life, and it doesn't want to face the reality of the present moment, which is where all that is important lies in the present moment. So Bhagavan would deflect too many questions about past lives and future lives and so on. And at the same time, he never denied their existence. He never said they don't exist. If you feel you are an embodied being, of course, there is a continuity in uh, this life cycle for the mind and body. And yet, are you really the mind and body? Was what Bhagavan wanted to focus on. The Shruti here says, let us temporarily take the stand, okay? There is mind and body which is having a certain journey in time within time. So what happens? What governs the next embodiment of the uh, jiva, of the being, of the, of the individual? And in the Kathopanishad, there's a very beautiful verse which I'll share with you. Yoni manye prapadyante shariratvaya dehi naha sthanu manye anusamya it says, So, born of the strong desire to manifest the other samskaras, unfulfilled samskaras, which are now started fructifying, born of that strong momentum, this Dehinaha, the one who dwells inside his body, acquires another embodiment. Sthanamanni Anusamyan, he gets connected to another body. The example given is of a leech. A leech, it is said, holds to one uh, leaf or one point on the ground and then extends itself and then connects to another. So there's an intermediate state when it is connected to both. Maybe the animal, uh, like a cattle or like a cow or a goat, onto which it wants to get onto to get its blood being. And so initially it's holding onto the ground and then it extends itself and catches another animal. So, anusamyanti, it, it is having this anusandhan to another place. There's a connection to another embodiment. 
And then the jiva lets go of the old embodiment and goes to the next one. Like even a leech lets go of its old connection and jumps onto the next one. And then the critical idea here is, he says, this is governed, Yama here says it is governed by Yatha Karma Yatha Shutam. Yatha Karma, as per the actions done by that gentleman in his life. And Yatha Shrutam. So that's the key word for most of us. Yatha Shrutam is to the degree to which you have owned up this knowledge, to the degree to which you are convinced about what you have heard. Shrutam means we heard. But it's not just any odd words, but it is those words which you have deeply lodged in your buddhi. It's that which you are convinced about even in your deep sleep as it were. It's as clear as daylight that you feel this is true. And so that is Yatha Shrutam. So if you have some degree of clarity about Atman, about the self, to that extent, your next life will be governed by that clarity, whatever that notion you have. If you feel I must pursue meditation or dhyana and I have no much interest, let us say, in artha and karma, that is in uh, you know the pursuit of security or certain pleasures, I don't have a real you know affinity for that. That is yatashruta. That is to the extent you have assimilated this vision that you are already what you want to be. That has been partially understood. I revel in my own self. I am happy and content just being myself. And that is the degree to which the Parshvatam has happened. And that's going to decide the next life. <clears throat> so even if a person has a set of karmas, what supersedes that is his understanding. That's a big relief. So let's say a person has a mix of positive and negative karmas, but he has by some grace a certain degree of great clarity about what he is, about uh, the Atman, then that is going to supersede the effect of karma. And so therefore, that is much more significant as a determinant of the next life. And so that is why Bhagavan would always say, just don't worry about what actions you did. You, oh, I'm a sinner. There was a devotee who came to Bhagavan saying, Bhagavan, I have done so many sins and uh, only you can save me. Uh, what will happen to me? And Bhagavan says, just ignore this idea that you are a sinner and cast your burden on Ishra. The more a person has that attitude of surrender to Ishvara, have the conviction the Ishvara will protect you. Bhagavan says that. The idea is if the conviction is very strong, it will overrule even the effects of karma. Not just lip service conviction, but very deep rooted shraddha is present in a person, and then that will overrule and supersede any actions he has done. So that is the big relief for all of us. We are no longer really bound by karma if our conviction and shraddha in the Guru, this words, the teaching of non-duality is very strong. The more clearer, the more clear it is, the more it is going to determine everything about us in the future. So that is the gracious message of Bhagavan and the Bhagavad Gita in these two verses. With this, I will conclude today's study. If any questions are there, please feel free. Otherwise, we will end the session here. Anuragji, you can just take over. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Raghavji. We do not have any questions on YouTube as well, so uh, we might conclude the talk. Shanti Mantra, in that case. Thank you.
Thakurji, thank you so much uh, for the session. We shall meet you again next Sunday. Uh, I would now request Narayanji to initiate uh, Akshar Manamalai and uh, Arati. Narayanji.
This brings us to the closure of today's Sunday Satsang at Raman Kendra Delhi with Raghavshi. We shall reconvene next Sunday at the same time. Namo Ramana. Namo Ramana.